morning, everyone. Welcome back to the traditional Thomist. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Nicholas Cavazos. And today we are starting uh, the first episode in a series that's probably going to last a couple of years, if not more than a couple of years, if not maybe a decade or longer than that, who knows. But uh, what we're going to be starting today is the, uh, I guess, walk through the Summa, a um, kind of an expositional line by line um, yes, yeah, study of the Summa Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas, using the commentaries of the great anti-modernist theologian of the 20th century, Father Reginald Garigou Lagrange. Now, before we start this, what I want to say is a couple of things. Number one, I am not a Thomistic expert in every area of the Summa or any of other Thomas's writings. That's why we're using commentaries uh, to really help us along. Uh, so if I do say something which is against um, the teaching of Holy Mother Church in any way, take what I'm saying and tune it out, throw it into the fire, uh, don't listen to me. Uh, so I just want like, to be clear on that because you know I'm still learning, I'm still trying to understand all of these things myself, and so I don't want to give my opinion out there and for people just to kind of take it as gospel uh, without doing a lot of their own research. That's kind of one of the reasons I'm doing this uh, series is I want traditional Catholics to actually study their faith in a concrete, systematic, and scholastic way, as opposed to what I kind of see online, which is people generally in the traditional world. And, and again, I don't know how true this is per se. Maybe, maybe you guys can enlighten me if this is your personal experience or not. Put it in the comments below. But uh, it seems to me that a lot of traditionalists kind of fall into the pitfall of being like hardcore conspiracy theorists, which again, right, just because there's a conspiracy theory doesn't mean that it's not true or that there's not merit in the theory. But rather than, uh, I guess, academically and scholastically criticizing the Novus Ordo Mass, the abuses that take place inside of the hierarchy, um, the complete lack of doctrinal clarity we have on major issues, um, or things along that nature, rather than going back to St. Thomas, rather than going back to the scholastics, what they seem to do is uh, kind of just, uh, you know, shout and point the finger and things along that nature. That's just kind of been my experience, what I see online. Now, on the flip side, what I do see in person is kind of another world. Uh, the traditional parish that I do attend, uh, as many of you guys know, is a diocesan Latin mass parish, and so it's filled with uh, diocesan uh, TLMers, and most of the time, you know, they kind of, you know, get a lot of their sources from just like really basic catechisms, which thumbs up for that, uh, or just stuff that they'll see online as well, and so these people are filled with great charity for souls. However, at the same time, they don't have really a systematic form, uh, formulated, um, I guess, program or text that they can go and they can use uh, that can really help them combat uh, the just ocean of modernism we seem to be swimming in at the moment inside of the church. And so what I want to do today is, yes, present this introduction, talk a little bit about how this will work. Um, but then as you can see in the title of today's episode, we're not mainly just talking about, right, the Summa Theologica and like what it's all about. Rather, what we're going to be doing is talking about Thomism, scholasticism, and the interior life. So let me go ahead now and talk about uh, a concept that really changed my own personal life uh, as I was becoming more and more um, involved with inner church working, so to speak. So as many of you guys know, I uh, love theology, right? That's why I made this channel. I love theology. I love to teach uh, theology to other people. Uh, I love to help people in the best way I can in that particular area. However, theology and being a theologian, which is what I want to be whenever I get a little older, finish all of my master's and doctorate work, um, what, what theology is, is it's not just studying information from a book, right, just to know that information, or it's not just to study that information with the end being just orthodoxy by itself, like that's the only end that it can be. But rather, what theology is supposed to do is it's supposed to draw us in to the divine life of our Lord and Savior. It's supposed to make us contemplate these divine realities. Contemplation is the key. Contemplation is the end 
by which we are wanting to become unified with God. So therefore, when we look at Holy Scripture, when we look at the Summa Theologica, when we look at uh, a devotional work, uh, the lives of the saints, anything, we want to read these works and ingest them on the level of the interior life, to ingest them and to ask ourselves the question, well, how does this affect me? How does this affect what I do? How does this affect the people that are around me? Should I do this or should I do that? Should I not do this? Should I not do that? We have to ask those questions. And then we start asking ourselves the deeper questions of like, how does God see me in this? Or, or how does this affect my relationship with God? Or when we're studying the person of God himself, all theology leads back to God, right? It's all about him. Theology is 100% about God. And we ask ourselves these questions, well, how does how does this understanding of God affect my life? How, how ought I to worship God with this truth? I give an example. If God is infinite, and if God is at the same time, if the Son of God is eternally processing from God the Father, with that knowledge, how ought we to act? Are we just going to take that knowledge, and which is true, uh, as just orthodox knowledge, and we just believe it, and that's it? Or are we going to take that knowledge and say, wow, this God is, is infinite. This God is powerful. This God is all-knowing. How ought I to worship this God? How am I created in the order of nature, in the order, uh, in order to do that? How am I, you know, how am I rightly ordered to worship God? Asking these questions, and then these questions fall onto other questions, like, well, if we're supposed to worship God because he is our creator, if we're made to, as the Roman Catechism says, to know, love, and serve God, then how ought we to worship God, right? And this goes back to the virtue of religion, and the chiefest act of the virtue of religion is the holy sacrifice of the mass. And so you see how when we understand these truths, it leads down into other areas of our, of our own life and of the lives of people around us. So with that being the case, I want to now talk a little bit about, um, yeah, this concept of the interior life from the perspective of the saints. So what we're going to do now is we need, we're going to shift from recognizing, okay, number one, the interior life is what the theology should be pointing us to, what, right? What theology should be doing is leading us into a closer and deeper relationship with the person of the Savior, Jesus Christ. With that being the case, how does that happen? When we read theology, we have to then step from theology into prayer into contemplation and ask ourselves these questions of, okay, how am I ought to acting, right? Prayer is the key. Traditionally, a theologian is known as one who prays, not just one who studies, but one who prays. The Dominicans do this perfectly with the balance of prayer and preaching. But in order to preach, you have to study. In order to preach with power, you need the fire of the Holy Ghost, that continual access of grace with inside of you. So whether it's prayer or preaching, or study, it's all flowing in and from the person of God into your soul, and then we give that back out to other people. That's something that I think is very beautiful, but how much do we pray? How much do you pray? Do you pray five minutes a day? Do you pray one decade of the rosary today, uh, and then maybe another decade the next day? Do you pray the divine office? Do you pray eight hours a day? Who knows? Maybe some one of you is out there. Um, how much do you pray? And it's, again, not necessarily also so much how much do you pray, but what is the what is your prayer life like? Is your prayer life um, just kind of repeating things over and over again aimlessly? Or um, is your prayer life you only going to God to ask for petitions? Um, or is it deeper than that? Is it how, what is your prayer life like? Regardless of, of how your prayer life is or where it stands, we all must pray. Prayer is completely essential to the Christian walk. St. Alphonsus Liguori is famous for this statement. He says this, quote, whoever prays is certainly saved. He who does not is certainly damned. All the blessed have been saved by prayer, although the, the damned have been lost th through not praying. If they had prayed, they would not have been lost. And this, and this is and will be their greatest torment in hell. To think how easily they might have been saved just by asking God for his grace, but that now is too late. Their time for prayer is gone, end quote. Something that's truly um, saddening to recognize that many people who go to hell, 
don't pray, right? Our Lady says to, the, I believe it's the three children of Fatima, she says that um, many souls go to hell because there is no one to pray for them. That's why it's so important for us to maintain the interior life, to maintain that um, interior disposition that is needed for salvation. So that being the case, uh, I just want us to kind of get that as a groundwork before we go into the larger part of the Summa. What we're going to be doing over the subsequent weeks, months, and whoever knows how long <laughs> after this point, is we're going to be going article by article through the Summa Theologiae, and we're going to be using the commentaries of Father Reginald Gary Lagrange. Unfortunately, these commentaries are pretty scarce in English. You can find some of them. Most of them are like $900 on Amazon or something like that. Uh, I've managed to find my copy for 30 bucks. Uh, it was uh, definitely um, in God's providence that got me <laughs> to that point. Uh, but what we're going to be doing is, yeah, going through and we're going to be asking ourselves, okay, what does this article mean? How does this apply to my own interior life? How does this apply to the lives of the people around me? How ought I to worship God? We're going to be kind of looking at the Summa from that perspective. And from the perspective of, of understanding these things in the context of understanding orthodoxy. Because at the end of the day, let's be honest, the church will always suffer persecution. The church will always suffer um, calamities and crises inside of her. However, I would, I would be of the um, opinion that the current crisis in the church that we are going through in right now is the most serious that the church has ever faced for the sole reason that uh, unlike, say, other crises that came before, which devastated Christendom, this crisis affects us on all levels, not just um, in the hierarchy, but down to the smallest catechism class. You ask many Catholics nowadays really basic questions about their faith, and you'll find that either, one, they don't know what their faith is, or two, that they believe in something completely opposite of what the church teaches, and knowingly so. There's so many studies out there that talk about things like, you know, 89% of Catholics believe, accept, and use contraception, or that, you know, like 40% of German Catholics uh, believe in the resurrection of our Lord. Um, you know, like 12% of French Catholics believe uh, in the existence of a real hell. These very concerning things, and we, re we need to go back to what established the church and made her strong in the beginning, and then move forward from there. So with that being the case, uh, as we move forward, I hope that you guys continue to stick around. If you guys have questions for me, please put them in the comments below. I love hearing from you guys, even though I can't see you in person. Uh, I do still love hearing from you guys. It lets me know. Um, yeah, let me know how you're doing. Even if you're just doing okay, just say, hey, I'm doing okay. Uh, we'll definitely like just to hear from you. And so, yeah, as we go along, please stick around and stay tuned. Uh, what we're going to be doing uh, next week is going into a little bit more on the interior life. We're going to be looking specifically at what Father Reginald Gary Lou Lagrange says about the interior life, um, as well as potentially starting Article 1 of the Prima Pars. And so that being the case, uh, yes, please stay tuned for that. Also next week, you will be getting your first episode of a Thomistic critique of the Novus Ordo Misae of the New Mass. Uh, so please stick around for that as well. And as always, my friends, thank you so much for tuning in and listening. May our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, St. Joseph watch over you and protect you. God bless.